did a national study with LifeWay. Um, have, have any of you guys seen the study results from LifeWay? Um, I'll just direct you on the Exponential website on exponential.org forward slash ebooks. You can download for free the study that we did with LifeWay on the level five multiplication. They did a statistically validated national study to figure out the percentage of churches at the five levels. And there were a lot of good learnings in there. You can download for free that report. Um, here's what I wanna say that's, that's consistent with, but there's a little bit of a change in the narrative the way we're doing the five levels. So that's why I wanna go ahead and spend a minute. Um, here's what I want you to think about. Levels one and two and three, We've, we've defined level one as subtracting. And when I say subtracting, most of you can picture a graph if this is time and this is number. Hey, Todd, we can't see your screen right now. We can just see oh, you. Sorry about that. <clears throat> can you see it now? I can, yeah. So all I've drawn here are two overlapping circles and labeled the, the thing on the left one, the overlap two, and the thing on the right three. And this graph right here is the number of something versus time. The beautiful thing about math, and when I say subtraction, it doesn't matter how far on the, you're a Bible person versus a math person. In math, when you say subtraction, most people think that's going down with time. Something is going down. Um, then at two, you've got um, plateauing. So if I said, what's plateauing look like versus time? Most people would see plateauing as a stuck or a flat level on something. And then at level three is addition. So on a graph, most people see addition going up. Do those three mathematical things make sense? Sub subtracting, plateauing, and adding. You, here's the reality just physically. Of the 340,000 churches in America, 100% of the churches, 100% of, uh, of the 340,000 churches, you could put into one of these three categories. So that 100% of the churches, you're either subtracting, plateauing, or adding. Now, how you define the culture of subtracting and how you define the culture of plateauing and the culture of increasing, we worked with LifeWay because they've got a lot of experience in this. So these are not just attendance numbers. It's an aggregation of everything from baptism rate, you know, what's the transformation rate? Is it stuck? Is it growing? What's the staffing doing? What's the budget doing? What are the attendance numbers doing? So don't just think these are attendance numbers. They're an aggregation of things. And here's what the LifeWay study found in this national study. 35% um, of churches are at level one subtracting, 35% are plateauing, and 30% are adding or growing. So that adds up to 100% that you, you stick them in there. So that means seven out of 10 churches are either plateauing or declining. And yet, here's the reality. Is that a good or a bad thing? Like, I'm gonna suggest to you that it's not a bad thing. Like for 2000 years, that's been the case. If we could go back to 400 AD and do this LifeWay study, I think you'd find almost a consistent number. Like, I don't know that it would be that different. And the reason I'm saying that is think about the normal life cycle of anything. Peter Drucker, the father of modern management, he said that rarely in the history of mankind can you find an institution or organization with a sustaining impact greater than 30 to 35 years. What he really was doing was the S life cycle of something. The human body, you know, the average person lives 82 years. And there's a season of growth and a season of plateau and a season of decline. Subtracting, adding, and plateauing are natural rhythms of life. And here's the deal. Um, there's not a single church around today 
that was here 2000 years ago. You just got to let that sink in that God did not in his wisdom, he did not design his church for an individual local church to be eternal. Like it's hard to wrap your brain around that, but we don't have one local church in the entire history of local churches for 2000 years that was here 2000 years ago. The perpetuation of churches is a local church that has a season of plus minus and plateau and dies, births other ones who birth other ones that what has brought us through 2000 years of church is at the end of the day, new churches getting started because just like the human body dies, so do churches. So given that that's how God designed it, like what would we think these percents would be if God didn't intend that an individual local church would be eternal? If there would be a life cycle to an individual local church, it should not surprise us 35, 35, 30. I would actually suggest to you, these numbers affirm exactly what you would think it would be. And I'm also going to suggest to you that if you went and looked at businesses, the, the U.S. business thing does the same kind of statistic. They track churches on a 25-year life cycle. And the private sector life cycle is almost identical to what we see in churches, like in terms of the, that part of the dynamic of the organizational part. So here's what I want to leave you with on this one. If you think about the three or four or five churches that you really would like, man, if we could just be like Andy Stanley's church, or we could just be like Craig, Craig Rochelle's arguably got one of the best churches in America with 28 sites at this point and a hundred thousand people and they're growing and the Bible app and all the stuff they've got. So let's just put your head around, around life church and Craig Rochelle right now. Okay. Guess what? If Craig Groeschel's church experiences the same fate that 100% of churches in the history of Christianity have, have had, if you were a betting person, you would bet that Life Church won't be around in 75 years. That's hard to think about. Like you think about the impact that Life Church is having. Here's what we know Craig Groeschel won't be around in 75 years. And neither will any of the leaders who are part of his team in 75 years. The only question is, what will his church be doing? And I'm going to suggest to you, the, the only thing that you can take certainty in from a legacy standpoint isn't what they build and accumulate during that 75 years they might have favor to exist in. It's going to be what they propel and catapult forward that lives beyond their church. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that's where the multiplication part becomes important. So here's what happens just on the, you guys have seen the picture. I'm now going to add in, if this was one, two, and three, minus, plus, now let's add in the idea of reproducing and multiplying at level five. All right. Um, if 100% of churches have a core context at one, two, and three, they're subtracting, plateauing, or adding. The question is, what percentage of churches also exhibit level four or five reproducing or multiplying characteristics? And, and what I need you to get your head around is 100% of churches have a core at level one, two, or three. And then the only question is what percentage of churches will also have a characteristic behavior at level four and five? In other words, you can be adding at level three and your core, like you could be an addition oriented church and at the same time be reproducing or multiplying. Does that make sense? So you've got Craig Groeschel's church is, a, is an adding church. They're growing and adding but simultaneously, they, they're planting lots of churches and they're, multi, you know, they're reproducing and multiplying, starting campuses, planting churches. Does that make sense? That, that you've got to think of the four and five behavior as a separate thing from the one, two, and three core. 
your church will be at one, two, and three. The only question is, will it exhibit level four and five characteristics? So here's what happens in the LifeWay study. We found that at level four, 7% of U.S. churches, so of the 100% that are at level one, two, and three at their core, only 7% of those 340,000 churches are also exhibiting reproducing behaviors. So in other words, if we bring this to the family metaphor, uh, um, not all families have kids. So in that kind of analogy here, if 100% if of families are measured, and we said what percentage of married couples have kids, the equivalent here would be 7%. If we were asking in marriage, what percentage of people who are married have kids? Now, here's what I want you to think about. In that kind of thing, Noah's repopulate the earth, be fruitful and multiply, Adam's be fruitful and multiply. What if only 7% of family, of married couples had kids? What would happen if only 7% had kids? We wouldn't be so here. Civilization would end. 7% will not sustain civilization. It, because of death rates and attrition and, and all that, okay? And so level five, this is essentially 0%. You can find a handful of level five multiplying churches. This is all US numbers, by the way, not international US. So a total of 7% of U.S. churches are either reproducing or multiplying. Now, the question is, why? And this is where we're going to get into the three dimensions. Um, I'm going to just quickly, because I know you've seen it, but it's important. On the five levels, so you got one, two, three, four, and five. The number one thing you've got to understand in interpreting this chart is I want you to imagine right in the middle of level three is this ginormous magnet. And what do magnets do? Magnets attract, okay? And so it's not surprising that the measure of success is addition. Like if you're at level one or two, if you're subtracting or plateauing, what do you just instinctively want to do? You actually want to grow. You want to add. It's not a bad thing. I mean, we want to add. In fact, at the core of all level four and five behavior, it's built on addition. So the fact that level three this magnet very strongly draws us to level three. There's just this natural instinctive, we want to grow personally, families, churches. It's what, it, it drives the operating system of life that we want to grow. We don't want to be declining. Now, here's the question. In the operating system of the U.S. church, what's the operating system do to draw, what is the magnetic force that's drawing to the level three magnet? And first you have, this is where we go back to where we started with the definition of success. You just have to picture all those outreach lists every year, the largest, fastest growing, most innovative churches. That's the pinnacle of level three right here. That's what this magnet's trying to do is draw us to be the largest, fastest growing, most innovative, how do we break the next growth barrier? So here's what happens. All of these arrows coming to the magnet, there is a formula for that. It's, it, the U.S. church has a franchise model. You got to have permanent buildings, the best Sunday morning show, monster outreach events, killer good marketing programs, the best worship things, the best children's ministry, all of this operating system right here, the magnet, the word that goes here is programmatic. Right? Programs drive the operating system. Now, here's the question I have for you. Um, if we jump to the other end of the spectrum, which is relationship, a disciple who makes a disciple who makes a disciple, 
a disciple who makes a disciple makes a disciple is naturally inherently reproducing and multiplying. In fact, the fruit of a relational discipleship, kind of the way Jesus does it, the fruit of that is reproduction and multiplication. Let me ask you this. How many programs in the history of Christianity naturally, inherently, organically reproduce and multiply? The answer is exactly zero. <laughs> the problem with a programmatic approach is it takes energy, resource, time, effort, and then it doesn't reproduce itself. All of that energy is to grow it. I'm going to use the words to feed the beast. On the left side of this magnet leading up to level three, we put all this programmatic energy into building the infrastructure and building the ability to grow and add. And our energy is not instinctively going into something that will naturally reproduce. It's going into something that will consume and consume and consume and consume and never satisfy. Does that make sense? So here's the, here's the thing and we're, I promise we're moving on. So every magnet attracts both ways. On the other side of this magnet is a magnetic field pulling back the other way. And here's what I need to share with you. Uh, eight or nine years ago, before we even had this level five thing, it's partly what prompted it, um, we convened uh, 11 mega church pastors and Alan Hirsch. This was like nine years ago now, 10 years ago. And all it was for was a retreat. Um, we, we kept hearing prominent megachurch pastors. And, and in our case, these were all megachurch pastors who were also leading national church planting networks. So the, the profile of these megachurch guys were they're leading national church planting networks and megachurches. And the reason we pulled them together had nothing to do with church planting. When we were traveling around, we kept hearing Mega church pastors say, the bigger my church gets, the more lonely I get. And so we pulled a retreat together about nine years ago to help just to get these mega church pastors together with no agenda other than relational fellowship together. And so no agenda. We went around the room the first time with the 11 mega church guys. Alan Hirsch was the last, sitting 12th position. And um, it's kind of comical that Alan Hirsch was actually there, and I, you know, he was just a friend at the time, and we had him come to sit in. But um, we went around the room the first time and said, uh, across all the domains of your life, your family, your church, your community, what's your biggest burden? And the first guy said, oh, it's easy. I launched my church 20 years ago. By God's grace, we're a mega church. We're doing multi-site. We're doing church planting. We're doing externally focused. And here's what he said, almost verbatim. He said, but there's not enough years left in my life to just keep growing this thing bigger. I'm interested in how to change the conversation from where's the next one to how do we release 150 of our people to take our city? And I get goosebumps telling the story every time because we went to the second mega church pastor and he said, oh my goodness, that's mine. Now, recognize they were given permission. That they could talk about their wife, their kids, their staff, their budget problems. It's like anything across all the domains of your life, what's your biggest burden? 11 out of 11 megachurch pastors said, that's mine, that's mine, that's mine, that's mine. Okay? Now, let me suggest to you that the left side of the magnet over here Okay, over here on the left. What they're all saying right now is, man, I'm in this operating system that consumes and consumes and consumes and we're growing and we're growing and we're growing. And I'm not sure that, I'm not sure I'm building this ladder against the right wall. Like, I'm wondering if there's something more beyond, not just I'm wondering, they're knowing there's something naturally beyond. Here's what they all were doing. They were all having midlife crises. People in the marketplace who spent 20 years like I did going up the corporate ladder and all of a sudden they wake up in their 40s and 50s and they're like, 
man, is this what I'm going to do with the rest of my life? Am I on the right track? You had 11 out of 11, 11, out of 11 megachurch pastors that are experiencing some form of been there, done that. Am I just going to stay caught up in this operating system over here? So here's what we did. We went around the room a second time and, and asked the question, man, if 11 out of 11 of you want to break free of this, what's, you all have money. You got big platforms. You got a microphone. You got staff. You got it all. Like, why aren't you doing the thing that you're discontented about? And here's what happened. The first guy said, oh, it's easy for me. We've got an $11.2 million building debt. I got I to gotta fuel that building debt. Like, I can't just start releasing people because the people I'll release are the ones paying my building debt. We went to the second person. The second person said, oh, it's easy. And I, I remember the number. We've got 927 children's workers it takes every week to run our children's ministry. Now, let that sink in. It takes 927 children's workers a week to run their children's ministry. That sounds like the 4,800 people on an aircraft carrier, okay? We got to have 927 people. And here's what the person said. How in the world could I get my full-time paid children's staff to want to convince their workers that they ought to be released into the community to do stuff beyond the walls of the church when they can't recruit 927 people a week to fill the needs we have? They said, we, basically what they were saying is, yeah, we'd love to release more people into the nooks and crannies of society, but we're having a hard time feeding the beast inside. This left side over here, we got to consume our resources to feed the left side. Um, third person, oh my goodness, every time we release one of our, you know, somebody to plant a church, it's our best staff people that want to leave and we have a momentum hit and da da da. Well, here's what they were all saying the left side's fueling it, but every one of the factors that got them to level three and sustains them at level three is the factor that's holding them back, just think about it, the building debt, the $11.2 million building debt. When you're on the left side over here and you're at level one or two and you want to spark growth to level three, how cool is it to get an $11.2 million building? In fact, all the studies will show you, you see a big jump in attendance when you get at your own building. So it is an accelerator over here but then it's also something that holds you back from level four and five behavior. Is that making sense?